focus. Like the tutorial focuses specifically on weekly supervised learning and to keep it compact and only half a day, three hours, we, we focus on that. But there is kind of these tangential topics that we didn't discuss much, such as uh, semi-supervised learning, transfer learning, uh, self-supervised learning, and also we discuss in the morning uh, training from noise. So I guess I'm curious to see Maybe we can discuss a bit about the differences and how they complement each other and kind of how each one of these play in the big picture of training you no know, big, uh, large systems. Um, so since Hagen, you, 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 you didn't get to talk so much in the morning, maybe, right, maybe okay. you can have your voice on that. OK, so maybe I can start speaking on semi-supervised learning. So uh, how is it different uh, with the supervised and semi-supervised learning? Um, so, in the uh, weekly supervised setting, what we uh, what our uh, tutorial focuses on uh, is uh, basically we assume that we have a training set, and for each of which we have a weak label. So this weak label for the detection, for example, or segmentation, semantic segmentation, can be an image level label. There is a bike in the image. So in the semi-supervised setting, uh, the assumption in the standard semi-supervised setting, the assumption is we have some regularly or fully uh, supervised annotated images, for example, for detection that would be a bounding box uh, in, for a bike in the image. So we have set of such training images. We also have sets of images which have no labels at all. So, um, so the difference is basically um, uh, so we have uh, different uh, so coarser labels in the same uh, in the weekly supervised and in the semi supervised we have regular plus unlabeled images and um, so the difference the difference is clear so it's also uh, it might be the case that you may have weak labels for some images and then you may have uh, strong or regular labels uh, for some images. So then uh, you can basically, there are papers focusing on the mix of basically semi-supervised and weekly supervised labels. So basically they are complementary, I can say. Um, there was one question asking what exactly are weak labels? Right. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, do you mean like a generic definition for what is the weak label or is it for a certain application? I, I think you meant in general, like what's, what's the definition? I think I have a slide yeah. for this. Let me bring it up. I think this one. So the, at least the way I usually explain this, you, you, you guys see the share screen, right? So if when you do fully supervised uh, training, the training that you provide has the input image and the exactly desired output. So in this example, for semantic segmentation, which pixels should have which labels, for bonding box, for object detection, which bonding boxes should be there. And when we do weekly supervised learning, it can be any type of annotation except exactly what you want. So that's what sometimes we call hints or sometimes we call indirect supervision or what's usually called weak supervision, which means that it's telling you something about what you want, but it's not telling you everything that you need to know so you can generate the output. And the fact that it doesn't tell you everything uh, that you need to know to get the output is kind of the defining characteristic of what make a label weak instead of being strong or being full. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, I think yeah, this is a more generic. So in my slides in the tutorial, in the introduction, I, uh, I think I mentioned that having a coarser level of supervision uh, in at train time than expected output at test time. Hmm. Exactly. So it's coarser as examples. If you're going to do bonding boxes, you could say instead of a bonding box per instance, you could say this region contains three objects. That's an example of a weaker label for localization. Or an example would be you only say this whole image contains uh, some objects of this class and unknown numbers. Or some even there's some papers who do like they give you a specific number, tell you there's three cats on this picture and zero dogs, but you don't know where they are. Uh, if, again, if the task was localization. Mm -hmm. um, if the task is instance segmentation, where you want to know where, which are the each pixel for each object, then in that case, bonding box is a form of weak supervision, or semantic labeling will be a form of weak supervision, where you don't give everything that you need to know. So those are examples. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we don't have an easy way for us to ask questions to you, but uh, to the attendees. But maybe one, one question that I can ask you, and maybe you can answer in the, in the chat, uh, is like, 
what's, a, what's something that keeps you confused about weekly supervised learning? Right? So now, some, uh, Nara, Nara Shima, thank you very much for your question, was like, oh, what, what exactly are these weak labels? Um, maybe other of the attendees have other questions, things that are confusing or unclear um, that would you like us to redefine or re-explain or contextualize, um, and we'll be very happy to do that. So please put that, it's not asking you to put something on the chat. <laughs> And we'll read it and maybe from there we can interact because we can speak about what we like to discuss for an hour and a half. And this might be not the thing that would be most interesting for you, the audience. So if you give us any hints, we can maybe uh, direct the discussion to topics that might be more relevant to what you, know, where you are at in your learning curves or in which topic you're actually working on. Um, so maybe let's let's look back into in the meantime. Let's look back into this uh, semi-supervised learning, right? That the hacken you were describing. All right. Um, do you want to say something more? So I, I guess uh, maybe in more realistic settings, one may say that um, we have uh, it's easy to collect uh, annotations for few images. Um, so um, obviously for object detection, maybe it's easy. For semantic segmentation, it might be even still some work to do even uh, label an image. But um, maybe we can say that uh, so semi-supervised learning plus uh, combined with weekly supervised one uh, can offer you uh, much better accuracy than pure weekly supervised learning. So it might be more realistic as well for uh, practical applications. Yeah, I also want to add that um, the distinction between semi-supervised learning and Wix provision is, it feels like it's more academic way of splitting things. Um, in practice, you seem to have more cases where everything is combined. So you have um, a, f a set of full, uh, fully supervised images where uh, you want to evaluate your model, but then you can uh, make use of already existing weak labels as well as unlabeled set. And um, in practice, the question is how to combine those different sources of uh, supervision. But, but to make uh, conceptual comparisons and, um, and also to compare the numbers, you have to set up a, a pure, like clean, uh, benchmark, and there you get all these distinctions like weak labels and weak supervision and semi supervision, and so on. Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, I will agree with June in this aspect that the in practice, when you collect the data sets, uh, which which I talk a little bit about that process in the human in the loop uh, video of the of the tutorial, um, there is. Um, you will, the first step usually is you collect a bunch of images and then given the budget, you start annotating those images. And it's not uncommon that you end up annotating only a subset of all the images you collected for a million different reasons. So mm -hmm. then in practice, you almost, like in the practical sense, you almost always end up in a semi-supervised case where you have most of the images annotated and some they didn't, or maybe the rest, some, you did, some, some that you did annotate and some they did not. And then the ones you did not usually say like, well, <laughs> we don't use them. <laughs> we just throw them away. But if you use a semi-supervised learning technique, then you can add that in. Um, similarly, uh, into uh, echoing one more time what June said, uh, for the transfer learning setup, right, where you using a different data set of a similar task and trying to use that as, as a better training for your models or as a way to know you can train a model on that set then run, run, run an inference over your target set and then do some kind of transformation of those results uh, that can help supervise your task. That's another way of doing transfer learning. Those usually are also pretty common in practice because you almost always have some other data set you have access of. Uh, maybe it was a previous iteration of your data set. So for instance, that happens in, in practice for um, in many robotics, robotics setups where they collect a bunch of data for a specific hardware configuration. And then you no know, comes a new year and they change the new hardware configuration, which is similar, but not identical to the previous system. So they need to retrain the whole thing and the, over the new collected data with these new sensors. And that's a typical example in robotics where, well, you won't throw away everything that you annotated before, right? You will transfer whatever was learned into these new uh, sensor configurations as, as one of many other examples. Um, so um, definitely in practice, you end up having this mix of, um, of uh, semi-supervised transfer learning. I, I will, I will get there. I was probably in noisy labels. It's, in practice, it's almost always there and 
in, in academia, we like to think, no, this, everything is perfect. And for small sets, that is true. For big sets, it's almost never true. Um, maybe the one that is, that is more not so common, doesn't appear by itself yet, is the self-supervised learning. So in self-supervised learning, um, it's also called unsupervised learning, and both, I think, are terrible names. They mean human-supervised learning, um, where you don't use annotations to train your system, but you use the smartness of a human to craft some, some strong priors into a training. Um, so these are, the, these are methods that we basically try to pre-train the models using unannotated data. So you just have a large collection of images, and then you try to a train a model of that. And, and to be fair, also many times those papers, they, they cheat. <laughs> they, don't, they don't do the real story because they are supervised by how the data set was created, right? So they're supervised by the fact that this may be a finite amount of classes, or they're supervised by the fact that the classes have a similar amount of instances per image, or they're supervised by the fact that the picture was taken to show the object of interest at the main element. And many of these techniques exploit that. So they call themselves unsupervised, but they are um, human supervised or very weakly supervised uh, in there. But that's that's something that nowadays is more and more interest. And as we get more raw data and more computing, I think th there were a couple of workshops in this conference uh, talking about that. And that will basically increase the capabilities of our pre-training. So I think you, you can think of it as like a improved pre-trained model and in a, a different version of transfer learning. And that's something that in practice, like now is getting there with uh, an NLP, where there's a lot of really strong models that were trained on the image, the text on the web. But we don't, I don't think we have the real equivalent yet on computer vision, but it's, it's coming, like it's coming, you can see it. Yeah, I also hope to see that coming, this uh, large pre-trained model that could solve a lot of problems in vision domain. But, um... But yeah, I don't see any uh, any close equivalent of that yet in the in the field. I see the models right. are, the model sizes are increasing and the data sizes are increasing as well, but not really getting there in terms of performance. Yeah. Oh well, I mean the way I think of it uh, is this aspect of um, technological inability. Inavit oh, I'm going to get there. Technological inevitability, something that is cannot be avoided. In inevitable. Yeah. Technological inevitability. I'm not sure it's an English word. Well, so basically, technology is driven by, you know, uh, at least in, in modern times, it's driven by consumerism needs. Consumerism needs. So, if there's a product you can sell with the technology you're building, it's going to be built because it's a clear path towards money making. So, we're living in a in a current situation where, as long as things keep relatively stable and not be worse up here, uh, making smarter machines is a huge market. It's like huge, right? It's like insanely big market. So there are big companies, including the one where I work, where they're investing significant amount of money into making you no know, bigger computing, uh, better, big, bigger computer hardware and uh, bigger computing systems that can get closer to this capability of, of thinking machines. So there is a strong economic and need, a strong you know, aspiration from human dreams. And this, we have all the technical ingredients to keep pushing it, right? We, we, we don't have a physical frontier yet. So it's, it's basically guaranteed it's going to happen, right? It's like saying, you know, like how long it will take for a man to fly was unclear, but the desire to fly was always there, right? Like the, the desire to go to the moon was there for millennia and it's guaranteed we're going to go to Mars at the very least to put a flag on there, not because it's useful, but because we're like, we're doomed. That's, that's what we are, humans do that. And making a machine that can be like a human is such a strong draw, like it's going to happen. It's just a question of like, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. All right, with that uh, bigger parenthesis, we have our courageous uh, attendee of the day, of the slot, which is uh, Nara, Nara Sima, uh, who is asking a second question. Uh, all right, so how weak, can, how weak can it get is a question. For example, will the knowledge a priori of what products are in the store shelf act as a weak label for training a recognition system there? Okay, so now maybe that gets into uh, one more topic. Let me do one more tangent on this, which is um, fusion learning, right? So typical supervision, incomplete division, uh, pre-deep learning, but also early deep learning is the mindset is give me a thousand examples. So give me a thousand examples of whatever you want me to do, and then the machine is going to be able to mimic that. Um, actually, I like this term that um, Francois Cholet has. He says, like, no, a lot of people in the community are very 
unhappy about the abuse of AI, you know, artificial intelligence, and then this has pushed the actual artificial intelligence people into do artificial general intelligence. But François Cholet proposed to, as a replacement, instead of just machine learning, which is a bit dry, he proposed um, intelligent automation. So he said, like, we're not making intelligence, no, artificial intelligence, we're just making uh, automation, intellectual automation. So if you give a thousand examples of a computer vision task, then most algorithms today will do something quite good. However, um, in future learning, you say, what if it's not a thousand, but a hundred or 10 or two or three examples? Um, so in that sense, in that mindset, that's basically as weak as it can get, right? So what you can get as weak is to have very few examples, which are very loosely defining, but you still need to define the task, right? So in the sense, that's, that's kind of the whole point of what we were discussing before about the uh, uh, self-supervised, unsupervised training is the idea of like, what can I learn about the world without knowing the task that I'm being asked to do? I'm going to try to learn as many use of Yeah, let's wait for a bit until... Yeah, same, same computer that was morning, I know it's crashing. I closed all the other windows, I don't know what's going on. So uh, the, the system will learn all the potential useful tasks that the person that crapped the algorithm can bake in, but then you still need to define what the task that you want to have. And that's kind of the boundary of how weak the supervision can be. There needs to be something that tells you what are you looking for, right? What, what is the machine looking for? Um, so in that sense, um, the typical weakest supervision will be few images with very loose definition. Um, uh, so an example of this would be, um, you just show a couple of, literally a couple of cat images uh, where you say, this is what I'm going to call a cat. And then you figure out. In practice, however, I still want to warn uh, the, the attendees that this usually only works because the data set on which you're operating have been crafted in a specific way. Um, so typically that will only work if the images were intentionally showing a cat, which in the example that was put in the question about like a shelf, that, that might be the case, right? If you know these are kind of shelf pictures showing a product, then usually you have this strong prior that you can transfer from what is a background, what's a foreground, what's a typical um, empty area versus a cluttered area. And this can be leveraged by the algorithms. Uh, in practice, we is not that extreme, right? Like mo most, uh, if you watch some of the videos of, of the tutorial, most methods will go from image level annotations to bonding boxes, from image level levels to captions. But usually, they get away with it because they still have a relatively large volume of training data. Like little data that is weak, um, it's uh, slightly beyond state of the art today, but but worth is exploring for sure. I actually lose access to the Q&A. In the meantime, we got two more questions. So, uh, 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 from an anonymous at Kande, we got uh, another question. So, could you explain um, what would be deep levels in tasks which have a full image as the output, like depth estimation or super resolution? Um, so. Okay, so we haven't, maybe I can just say two sentences. We haven't discussed these examples. We focused on uh, mostly detection segmentation, but it's also possible. So, to, uh, so it's uh, also semantic segmentation is uh, uh, basically annotated typically with pixel level labels. So the full image is also, uh, is, so the, uh, the uh, annotation is like has image size. Um, so uh, for, I guess, I am not sure about depth estimation, sorry, uh, about super resolution, but for depth estimation, for instance, you may get things like uh, relative order of the objects. So which is closer to camera or which is occluding the other one. So it might be not the uh, absolute depth values, but some relative, uh, uh, how to say, uh, closeness of the, uh, objects to the camera, maybe uh, that can be a, a one good weak supervision. Any other ideas for the others? Uh, I think the exam, go on, Hagen. go on, yeah. go on, I also have one example from the image translation domain. Uh, so typically, uh, what I mean by image translation is uh, you, for example, try to change the style of the photo from one image to the other, like from the day day picture to the night picture. And for this, typically you need a, a paired data set uh, of the same image taken in the daytime and then 
the same age taken in the nighttime. But there was uh, this paper on, um, on uh, training this kind of image translation uh, without pair data set. It's called Cyclogan and uh, some, uh, some descendants of this paper. And they, they trained the system using cyclic consistency for, uh, uh, to translate one image to the other just by looking at the unpaired data, pair of data sets instead of pair of instances. I think this could be an, another instance of weak supervision. And it is, right? Because there the supervision was at the data set construction level. So the, the, the system yeah. knew that there were two data sets and that there was one side to transfer into the other. Um, but that is definitely weaker than, as you say, the traditional uh, image to image pairs. Um, another example of weak supervision for uh, depth estimation is, um, is it's, it's usually part of a pipeline. So it's not necessarily human supervision, but you will say, um, I'm going to have Okay, one, one specific example is if you have a LiDAR, right? So if you have a, a, a LiDAR sensor that provides you depth information, but LiDAR usually has lower angular resolution than uh, the cameras. So you get sparse points. And also depending on the surface, you might actually not get the signal in some of the areas. Uh, and depending on the type of LiDAR, you might get very sparse points or more or denser points. Um, and there are papers who then explore like given this, this very reliable but sparse points, how basically are densified to get, as you said in the question, uh, dense pixel-wise outputs. And another variant of that is to say, well, I'm not going to have a LiDAR because you know, they're expensive and so on, uh, but I'm going to allow myself to have multi-view matching. And multi-view matching you can do densely, but again, they're doing a lot of guesses. So usually what you can do is you can do multi-view matching and only keep the points that are very high confidence as depth estimates. And now this again becomes sparse signal for then that then you have to densify, uh, which is basically like an a proxy of asking the humans to annotate stuff. You just have an algorithm that provides you uh, sparse but reliable points and then from where you want to densify. And if you watch uh, some of the of the tutorial videos uh, or some of the, the discussion in the first slot, we talk quite a bit about this aspect of like using priors to go from partial but reliable information and then kind of densifying it and propagating uh, everywhere else around into your system. So th that idea comes often. And the last thing I want to say about this question is um, super resolution is an example of a task that is typically solved nowadays through our self supervision. Uh, if you have enough high resolution images, then you can simulate generating low resolution images and you train your models based on that. And that basically you know, kind of covers the task. Uh, we are getting there for a flow and depth estimation as another example of tasks that are now getting mostly self supervised, providing the right away good solution to the task instead of just a pre-training or something like that. So uh, depth, flow, and super resolution are the trio that I know right now is getting, I think also this initial results on SLAM, but those three are for sure getting, getting there with uh, uh, self-supervision only. And we have another question from Neil. Um, so how far uh, we are to achieve the same level of performance uh, of supervised learning? Um, maybe I can just say as a uh, number, so it wasn't uh, my slice in the about object detection. I think currently for object detection, the best uh, victim supervised object detector, uh, I think in Pascal book 2007 data set is close to 80% of the supervised uh, uh, performance. Um, so, um, and in MS Coco, it is around 60%. So it is not there yet, uh, not that close. But at the same time, uh, so what is not reported in the papers are the, so what if we use more uh, uh, weekly super or weekly annotated images? And um, uh, so this is, this is not uh, reported there. So actually that should be the promise uh, in a way that because they are easier, cheaper to annotate, so we may be able to get more of them. And yeah, so that's a question mark in the current papers. Yeah. Any other comments? Ideally, we probably want to show uh, the, uh, how do you call this, uh, interpolation between the weak provision and the full provision, and what's really filling in the void. Um, and probably here, as Hakan mentioned, we can increase the number of uh, weeks provision, but then we can also uh, look into in 
increasing the number of fools provision as well and how this curve goes up. I don't, I don't really have any reference for this type of plot uh, on top of my brain, but um, yeah, I, I'm sure I've seen something like this somewhere before. I mean, there's a list, there's a couple of papers who show also, there's two papers that come into mind to what just June, June just said, which is one of them are um, how close are we from saturating the models? Um, so the, there's a paper, um, I, I, I can't find it back to reference, but I think it was something similar to that, like revisiting the power of data or something like that, uh, which was one or two years ago that shows that basically state of their models, when you throw in millions of additional supervised image for classification, we don't reach saturation, right? So they, they have the uh, logarithmic uh, uh, decay, so it's like you need 10 times more data to get one more point, um, but, but, uh, but even then it keeps, keeps, keeps getting better. So that's definitely a signal that if instead of just throwing more data, you throw, uh, if you throw any kind of more data, even if it's weakly supervised, it's expected to keep improving. So we don't reach saturation there. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is that the recent works on um, weakly supervised, sorry, on self-supervised learning that they use as pre-training for then doing fully supervised classification tasks, they also show to somewhat their surprise, they, they still get quite a bit of a gain. So they get like one, two, three points of uh, classification improvement, which is significant because classification is you know, getting close to saturation. And this is just, just um, non unsupervised data that is thrown into the system. So the assumption for me would be, well, if you do get two points, let's say two points, by adding millions of uh, unlabeled images, then you should be able to get two points or more uh, by adding millions of weakly supervised images, right? So th those two examples show that there's more gain to be had. Maybe a different way to think about this is also just like Hagen say, like a, a ballpark to keep in mind is like 80%. Like you, if for mass task with weekly supervised, and again, it depends on which kind of weekly supervised on, but like ballpark number, you can get to 80% uh, with, you know, with high confidence. But another way to think of it is yeah, you can get to two years in the past. So whatever you have right now as weekly supervised, it's likely to be just as good as the best results of two years ago, right? And it's like a time shift of quality, given how fast computer vision is moving forward today. Um, so, and depending on where you are, what you're doing, that two years ago might be really good enough or might be not, right? And again, this is just like a, a ballpark number, but, but to keep in mind. It's, it's somehow not expected you get to 100%, right? And how small can the gap be will depend a lot of the specific application. And if you see the talk on, uh, on weakly supervised segmentation, on how strong the priors are. Like you can have a scenario where the priors are so strong that you need zero annotation to get perfect labeling. Like let's say that you have pictures of tennis balls that is only a tennis ball in a green background and you tell, well, everything that is yellow is a tennis ball. Done, right? You didn't need to annotate anything. Um, and there's actually some, some areas in NLP that do that. They, they have techniques where they have a interface where people can kind of handcraft weak rules and then that way they auto label the images and then they get, no, uh, sorry, auto label the sentences and they get good results. So in NLP, this actually has been done <laughs> explicitly. Uh, and in computer vision, it's a bit more of a nonsense. But the point is that uh, how, depending how strong you, how strong your priors can be, this will say how how weak can supervision be to get very close to 100%. And for most of the practical applications I consider on the papers, that gap is is larger because because they are harder tasks and they are more visual levers. There was another question from Martin. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, in the scope of this session, but if you have any model code at hand or in GitHub, it would be super useful to quickly look at an example on how a weekly supervised model plus loss works versus supervised approach. I know there are many approaches, so the question is rather ambiguous, but just any good example would be nice. Hmm. Yeah. So you want an example of code directly? Yeah, I mean, most most uh, biggest supervised methods these days uh, release their code, but if it is something to illustrate the idea, um, I'm not sure whether uh, we have such examples. Yeah, well, it's the the. Pro also, the premise is in to be, oh, go on, go on, June. Well, in the slides, we do have uh, references to papers. So 
they could mm -hmm. be good starting points mm -hmm. um, as well. Yeah, I think the difficulty is that most of these systems are relatively big and sometimes the weak supervision goes into how you train. So you can, uh, it's kind of a large code base. I, I cannot think of a very short code base that will show you, aha, this is how you do it. And the simplest example I can think of doesn't have any code base, which is the one I also presented in the, in the first slot about um, uh, just training in a normal way with noisy data, right? That, that's, um, so either it's too extreme and there's zero code, or, if it, or the, even the simplest example I can think of, actually more like a whole system that you look, need to look at kind of the whole code base. I don't know, maybe uh, how can your, uh, your weekly supervised detection paper, in a sense, relies on a couple of losses, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, how readable the code there would look like or not. If I had to guess something, I would guess that's probably mm -hmm. maybe the easier code base to look at. Right, yeah, I can, I can share that. I guess if you want to, um, Code up yourself what will be the easiest, for example, for weakly supervised localization or detection. One thing will be, for example, taking the images of, um, let's say, image nets and uh, splitting into div patches. And basically, uh, the goal will be getting a high uh, classification score. Uh, on uh, not on single patch but on their sum so let's say if you have a dog somewhere but you don't know where you can split your image into uh, different patches and just train with cross entropy but uh, uh, you sum up the uh, scores for each patch to get an image level uh, score so i don't know whether how easy the explanation is this one but um, but i can definitely share it I think uh, when, you, when you train a weakly spliced model, it like, for example, using uh, image level labels to train detection system or some localization system, then the code base looks more like a classification model than, than the localization model. Because, uh, because the output of this system should be classification output to train with the classification labels. So uh, I, I think if you look at the fully supervised model versus weekly supervised model, they will look very different a priori. Actually, maybe the, the one example that I'm thinking about is that comes to mind, uh, echoing what was Jim was saying, is the, just the CAM model, right? The CAM model is, you can think of it as a code modification. Um, and I don't have it in lines of code, but there's a diagram of it, uh, which is going to load in a few seconds. And there you will see it. Give me a couple of seconds. Where is it? This was obviously preloaded, but Chrome crashed. So it's coming. Here, here, here we go. So, um, one, one way of we, we supervise localization, uh, which is kind of the vanilla version, and this is explained in more detail in the recordings of the we supervise segmentation um, session, is that if you have a typical uh, classification architecture, like the one here on the left, is the mouse visible a little bit? Maybe. Let's yes. Try this. Let's go crazy. Hello? Yes. Right, sorry about that. Let's keep, yeah, I don't know what's going on. I don't want to reboot my machine because then it's even slower. Okay, I would just use the normal mouse. So I was just saying, if you have a normal image level classifier like a ResNet, and then on top you have, um, a tip in, at least in older models, you will have a fully connected layer. That's a typical classifier. And then one idea that's very classical, and again, I won't go in detail now, um, that has been proposed to, to change this is to say, no, you're changing the line of code. So instead of doing um, just a fully connected layer, you have uh, global pooling. So you just do global average over the whole um, a hidden layer of the convolutional output. And that will be your new classifier. And then there's actually an equivalence that you can switch this global pooling one layer below. So this is again another line change of code where you have global average pooling and then you have a one by one convolution, which is doing um, a linear combination to get the final classification scores. 
and that you know, three lines of change or code change uh, then allows you to get these activation maps that allows you to know where the image, where the model is looking at to decide you know, if, the, if the class is present or not in the image. So maybe that's the simplest example we can think of it's like three, four lines of code that would change from a normal classifier into a class activation mapping type of classifier. All right, I think that's, that's as far as we'll get on that question. Otherwise, as June said, citations um, and looking for the code, most of them have code available. Mm -hmm. Another question from Jin Huan. Uh, do you think the main problem of WSOD is caused by low IOU? The mainstream of WSOD paper seems to focus on finding the type box from discriminative part. What do you think about another problem of WSOD? For example, grouped box missing objects. I implemented WSOD model and I don't see much examples of grouped box, but number of mixing objects. Um, okay, so I guess uh, it may depend on what algorithm it is, but um, so in the beginning of uh, my uh, tutorial talk, uh, I have shown an analysis, uh, some error analysis from a previous paper, so which was which is not state of the art currently, but I think it may reflect the uh, current uh, ones as well. So I suppose the the uh, biggest problem is the low uh, intersection union with uh, ground truth, um, so low localization. Uh, basically and um, then the, uh, also another mode uh, error mode was um, basically objects in the bounding box in the ground truth bounding box but overlapping less than the, uh, uh, the desired threshold you know, than 50 percent so uh, this was mostly uh, due to the this, uh, discriminative parts for example for person category, you see this kind of error a lot. So it's basically the object detectors are learning to detect faces because all the person class instances have faces and sometimes you don't see the rest of the body. So faces are also easier to de detect. So this was another problem. And then another issue is uh, sometimes you see uh, predicted boxes uh, um, basically containing the ground truth bounding box and um, and this was happening in usually uh, in the categories where the context is important for example uh, for uh, boats and uh, uh, for boats it was the uh, water or the sea and for uh, let's say sofa uh, it was uh, or tv it was the whole living room because usually the uh, this kind of objects co-occur with other objects in a living room. Um, so these were the main issues. And I think, uh, so I have seen uh, when I was uh, doing experiments in this, that sometimes uh, when objects uh, co-occur together, object instances, for example, in the categories, animal categories, sheep and cows, you have lots of them together. So I have seen a couple of examples, mistakes where they are grouped in one box together. So thanks everyone who has been asking questions and I think thank Jingwen for joining us in the for a second round <laughs> of, of questions. Please please keep in asking. I see that we have more attendees uh, know that earlier. So no, this is a session of tutorial. People are welcome to ask any kind of questions. We're here mostly for that. Um, so maybe to, to add a bit to what Hagan was mentioning, this, this may bring us to one of the topics we had written down as a potential topic for discussion is this aspect of the ill-defined ill nature of the problem, right? Like the, another way of rephrasing what you just mentioned is like these are the problems of co-occurrence where you cannot tell apart you know, if the person is supposed to be a head or a head plus a body, or you cannot tell if the, you're, asking, if you're asking for sales, it's hard to, since most of the sales come with a boat, then it's hard to tell if you actually want only the sale or the full boat. Mm. And uh, the other issue is the issue of uh, so co-occurrence is one problem. Another one is like it's just estimating the extent of the object in general is is, 
somewhat it defined right here, unless it's like a very strong prior or very strong saliency respect to a, like a generic notion of background. It might, it might could be quite hard to tell where things begin or, or end. Even for humans, it's actually shockingly hard. I, I have done my fair amount of work in uh, just annotating data sets. And when you want to explain exactly what something is, it becomes very, very hard. Is um, and, and then you say, well, OK, let's not do it super hard. Let's do it loosely. And then you have uh, had a previous workshop where one of, the lesson, one of the slides from the presenter of the session was explaining all the mistakes my team did creating the data. And <laughs> it's always the same thing, right? We create millions and millions of training data. So either you do everything strict and you basically don't get millions and millions of training data, or you get everything loose and you have like 1% of errors, but 1% of errors, still thousands of errors. And that people will find and then point out as an issue. Um, so in a sense, the, the algorithms have the same problem, right? Um, um, I guess a, a typical example of this was, um, wh what is a potato? What is a potato? I guess like a, a potato is like easy, right? Like sure, potatoes, no problem, right? But then you look at, well, uh, like you know, in quarantine, potatoes were left on the table and then the plants grew out of the potato. So is the plants part of the potato or not part of the potato? Or then you have potato being uh, peeled and then the peel is still connected. Is the peel part of the potato? And then they cut the peel, another peel is separate from the potato. Is the peel still part of the potato? Or then they take the potato and they dice it. So you can tell it's potato being diced, but is that still potato? Or now it's like multiple potato is something else. So a simple thing as a, of course I know what a potato is, became hell, right? Like is puree potato? Like also not clear. Um, so if this is hard for humans, it can be definitely extremely hard for machines. So there needs to be some signal that that will define what do you mean and that is either going to come by a strong prior and then no whatever potato round potato shape of brown color that is going to be good enough and then you're going to accept that there will be some mistakes because that doesn't always fit mm -hmm. or you need to provide some human signal um that will solve this problem right like you you cannot just hope that the boxes will get tight by some magical aspects right so Either you do it through priors or the other aspect, which we also talk on, on the tutorial uh, in the human in the loop aspect, is that then you have basically some kind of active learning system, or if you look at the very end of the talk, uh, an annotation dialogue system, where the system learns everything they can learn from the weak supervision available, and then comes and asks a human, dear human, I'm not sure, is this part of the potato? Yes or no, please help me, right? And then you, the system pulls extra information from humans so that it gets to do, do what the human wants, or as a less fancy version of the same idea is that the human inspects the results, see this is wrong, and at least tell the system this is wrong. And that becomes extra supervision that is of different nature of the initial supervision you had. You want to add something on this, Jun? Well, yeah, I have the, a similar experience with the uh, annotation problems like it's super difficult to really define what an object is and to to um, to include all this kind of information you need uh, probably more than one example annotated per class and things get very much more difficult when when you try to encompass all different kind of variations in in data Should we uh, move on to the next question? There was another question on the live session from Neil. Uh, what will be the effect of using synthetic data in weekly supervised task? While tackling data starved task, we tend to use synthetic data like GAN generated ones, which may not be good in quality and may induce noise. Hmm. That's a really good question. Yep. <laughs> so, um, so one thing is, uh, so, okay, so I guess I am going to say something and then you can correct me whether I understand the question or not. So, um, so one thing is if GANs are typically used to generate uh, real looking images, um, so if we were to uh, learn some uh, distribution, uh, how real images looking from a set of images, 
Uh, so it might be very difficult. So we may learn to generate good images, but it doesn't mean that we will get labels out of it, right? Um, but um, so in this case, GAN, the vanilla GAN can provide images, but not annotations. But then we have conditional GANs. So for example, if we learn to uh, generate class conditioned images, for example, if we can generate uh, images with, I don't know, known categories, then they might be used in uh, certain um, uh, weakly supervised uh, methods. Uh, but it's very difficult to say, uh, like what would be the accuracy of that method trained with those. Well, but I, I think, I think if you expand the notion of uh, generation beyond images themselves, then probably you can also think of like generating pseudo labels for, for training a, a system may potentially be seen as a, a generation process. And in that case, uh, th there are many heuristics for creating pseudo labels for, for training a weekly supervised system using uh, weak sources of uh, annotations. Like for example, starting from CAM as a seed and then generating pseudo labels for semantic segmentation and then iteratively improving the pseudo labels after rounds of uh, training, for example. Maybe, yeah. But as Hakan said, uh, when you say GAN generated, yeah, it, it uh, it kind of uh, reminds me more of uh, data augmentation rather than weak supervision. Right. Uh, I mean, maybe another example can be if we have, uh, let's say, a renderer uh, which we can manipulate, we can control and generate images what we want, and then uh, we so then you, we can assume that we also know the. Uh, uh, labels for that image. So in that case, obviously, um, this would uh, this may help, and this might be used with the weekly supervised learning. It will be more like a semi-supervised learning then. But the issue is typically the domain gap with the uh, generated images and the uh, real images we want to uh, solve. So uh, it's a domain adaptation problem. So I would echo some of the things that were mentioned, right? So one aspect is that the, so I fully agree with Hakan, it has to be some kind of conditional GAN or something more than just plain vanilla GAN. Um, but then this also goes to what Jung was talking before, that you can you can use uh, GAN-like techniques to uh, basically learn some things about the data. For right? example, was there uh, learning to transform a day image into a night image? So in a sense, many of the papers, many of the ethics for using the GAN to augment data, I ended up doing some kind of uh, transfer learning or semi supervised learning where you have some form of supervision that is somewhere else, but then you are transferring through the gap. So, in this example, would be you know, you're meditating because you have supervised by creating the data sets of day and night images on which you can train to do trans spy transfer. Now you can augment your data to do uh, uh, day to night transfer because you have supervised it with that data initially. Right? So, then this again in between, it is doing the documentation, it is into the image. But the source of the information, in this case, was the supervision and the training system for learning to do day and night. Um, and a similar aspect of it comes in the second couple of papers of doing GAN-like systems for data augmentation. But data augmentation is the definition of baking in priors. And then you just, instead of baking in priors, which is like a fine transformation of small color perturbations, is you're building a bigger system that does uh, can enable image transformation, right? image, image transformation of some kind. And then both the generator uh, like the way you structure generator will constrain the kind of image that will come out, and the way you structure your overall GAN training architecture will structure the, the realm of variability that will be uh, explored by the system. So this is just a very large, fancier way to just bake in either transfer learning data or baking in additional priors. And maybe the last thing I would mention about this is that when you mention synthetic, uh, this is more than GAN, it's a way to do synthetic data. And this quite a bit of expression has been done 
in kind of two opposite directions. One is showing, and I think that we do have a paper on this, where the dumbest augmentation still works way better than what we would expect because the models actually are less good than what we would expect. So think like you just you have two images, one with the cat, one with the dog. You cut them by half, just cut them by half, place them together, and say like this is a cat and dog image. Pretty with that. Um, that actually works quite well. Right? The been shown, I think it's a kind of mixed uh, variant of work. Uh, or even worse, is a version that takes like a cat and a dog image and then they blend them half, half, half. So the, the image looks like a semi-transparent dog and a semi-transparent cat. And they turn this a cat, cat dog image and this also helps to get better results. So you can make synthetic images that can be enough for the realistic and still helps the training. And then the other opposite direction, which maybe is what the question goes a bit more, there are other ways to do somewhat photorealistic uh, data implementations. Uh, an example of that is the one that is also pre presented in the Rufus Provides segmentation video at the, towards the very end. I talk about uh, a code and paste technique where they train a full system so they can generate images where they have cut the instances and pasted it back in a different image so that so the whole thing looks photorealistic. And there is not a GAN per se, in the sense that the goal is not to generate a new image, but to cut and paste and recompose the images so they look realistic. And that's another type of synthetic images, which is another type of documentation, which is another way to make new tracks. Yeah. Hopefully it was uh, clear, so the Rodrigo's uh, voice was a bit breaking. So, uh, oh, really? Well, okay, we'll cut my video then. Uh, this, is, this is a new question now from Nara Shima. There's no improvement. Isn't the point of isn't isn't the point of the data but to make the labels? We know the labels usually before the data even manifests. That depends on the process. Right? So in some cases you will know, in some cases you might not, and in some cases even if you know the data, it's not the data you care about. So in the example of the cat and dog case, then you know the, the cat labels and dog labels, and then you get a new cat and dog image, but that might still be weakly supervised data. For your task of looking at localizing the cat and dog. So it's data, but it's not the full supervised data. Or the other example we're giving about uh, day and night, you are augmenting day and night, so you can detect cats and dogs by day and by night. But the fact that you know it's day and night is not helping you to the task of not localizing the dogs or localizing the cats. So, yes, you do know the labels, but those labels will not be the full supervised labels you care about. And otherwise, sure, you can also do like strong, strong supervising the data, and this also works. And it's not very well explored, and I think there's more to be done there. Um, but yes, that would be the scenario. Maybe to answer the question about does it bring uh, good quality or induce or induce noise, uh, or uh, and echoing what Narashima is asking, uh, is uh, yeah, it, it will add information to the system, but you you crafting the information from the system. So as the information you're providing is useful. Uh, and you're not distracting or providing errors that are not true, then yes, this should help more than it hurts if it's well done. Is my sound getting better or worse? No. <laughs> it's worse? It's oh. getting worse. Okay, let me, let, me re let me reboot it in my connection, on my, my web page, one more time. Sure. No, it's better, maybe? It's a bit better, yes. Right. You guys speak more. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So we're losing attendees now. <laughs> the uh -huh. ones who remain are the ones who want to do more. So questions welcome. Right, let's pick that up pick of the ones we had prepared. Let's see. Okay, we talk about is supervise. Um, maybe one, one thing we should talk about is the, the last question from last session. We didn't get to really answer it well, if, if I remember correctly. We got a bit short on time, right? Mm -hmm. What was it? Um, there was one about the one that Hagen was supposed to talk about. It was right. about detection, right? So that was yeah. from Jin Huan again mm -hmm. uh, on weekly supervised detection. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Francis. maybe let's let's re go over that, especially since Gene one is here too, so you can can even hear directly the more detailed answers. Uh, so maybe we can copy paste it as well. So uh, can we post it as a question? Um, you, can, you can put it on the chat. Somehow the uh, the panelists cannot qu ask questions to themselves, which I don't know why, but that's what it is. So this was the question. Right. So. so uh, so the, this uh, uh, question focuses on the uh, need to supervise object detection. And uh, it's basically uh, concerned about the limitation. So the limitation is the need to supervise object detection methods rather than learning to detect multiple positive instances, they usually uh, learn to detect one instance in a training image. And uh, so this is, this is, I think, mostly correct. And, um, and uh, I guess, uh, so it is a limitation and the limitation lies in the assumption that when we assume that an image is positive, so in object detection, this means in the big supervised object detection is if images like, let's say, car positive, we know that there is at least one card object instance, but we don't really know how many there are. So I think because of that, this is the, this is a good assumption that you should have at least one, and then you are looking for the strongest bounding box that can represent uh, the car instance. Um, but then, um, so, uh, so obviously the disadvantage of this one is when you train with such an algorithm, and then if you train, if you just learn to find the most prominent ones. And so you don't exploit leverage your positive instances enough or as good as in the supervised case. Uh, but I think more recent work is uh, kind of focusing on this uh, limitation more. So uh, there were a couple of papers kind of doing some mining on the positives. Uh, so it was, I think uh, one, one of them called is PCR, I think clustering the proposals, basically. So it's basically taking high scoring uh, region proposals and then uh, kind of clustering them into small groups and then assuming that they are the positive instances. So th this gets closer to uh, supervised object detection and it can leverage more instances. Um, okay, we've got a new question. So, Brent, maybe Jim, can you read the question? If my yeah. is not so good. Uh, okay, so there was one question from Brent. I just wanted to come and express my gratitude for the great. Uh, thank you. My background is more in robotics than computer vision, and your video provides a very. This is not a real question, is it? Uh, but thank you. Oh. Well, thank you, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also got a LinkedIn message today saying that they, they like the, they appreciated the tutorial and the videos. Um, so that goes for the, for, for all of you guys too. Mm -hmm. So thanks, it helps to know. It's, a, it's quite a lot of work to prepare all of these events. So we're happy that they help. Um, and they only come every two years. So now you have half an hour to just to max off the session. Because afterwards, we're gone for two years <laughs> until <laughs> next CCTV if we do something again like that. Um, all right, there was one, one of the questions that we had referred that maybe uh, it's good to use as a feeling. Oh, one more, correct. David. From David. It seems to be that the performance for semantic segmentation with image, label, image level labels have been saturated. What aspects, in your opinion, should be addressed in order to reduce the gap with full sub methods? Hmm. So to me, uh, my honest opinion is uh, fully supervised annotations will fill the gap. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe some other priors could help. Um, but to me, the definite answer is fully supervised annotations. Maybe not 100% of what you're using for training the full supervision model, but maybe something like 10% of uh, full supervision and then using a bunch of more weak supervision, like 
10 times more Wix provision for, uh, and combination of Wix provision and fools provision could possibly reach the fools provision accuracy. That, yeah, this would be my mindset when I, when I, uh, when I would try to write the next paper on weekly wise semantic segmentation. So I can complement to that in two dimensions. So first is the practical dimension, which I think June, June uh, hints at. Uh, and I agree that um, in, like, if you want to get going, that's the right way, just get going. <laughs> um, if you want to get fancy, either because you're going very large scale or because why not, why we're researcher after all. Um, uh, in the human in the loop uh, session, uh, I invite you to check it out, 25 minutes. I, at the beginning of the video, I tried to give a justification of why why you might want to do something a little bit uh, smarter than just pure uh, blindly annotating images. Because if you want to make the best use of the human annotation time, then you want to make the new annotations to be dependent on the model you already trained. So whatever you use for the supervised learning will give you in incomplete uh, information or like, like not the perfect model you need. And indeed you can improve it by full supervision. But I will, I will really to make the argument that you know, overlooking engineering efforts a more uh, better use of the human time is then to make the extra annotations to be basically based on active learning, to be model dependent annotations. So you drive the extra annotations towards the mistakes of the current model instead of what might be or might be not useful. So that's from the kind of practical dimension. And the other dimension, um, which is my current bet, my current bet, I, I spend quite a bit of time uh, in the mornings and the night wondering like one of the questions like that keep me awake in the night is this question of like what is the minimal supervision we need to get computer vision going like what is really what we need to have and what is just fluff for like i think people can be convinced that we don't really need to have a imaginary pre-training to get things going right is this it's an artifact and it's actually some papers have shown that nowadays with modern architectures and with existing data set you can just skip the pre-training and you still get very good results you, you don't this was you, it's uh, old news that you need the pre-training um, if you have large enough data sets like Coco or Cityscape, something like that. So, um, but I, one of my guesses, and uh, maybe uh, okay, I, I will dare the, the demos and I will try to share my screen one more time. Let's, let's try this. Mm -hmm. Let's see about this. Maybe that helps the sound quality counterintuitively. To share the screen? All if right. you share the screen. <laughs> best, best try. <laughs> Right. So I, I guess people might be familiar with this, but I'm not sure, so I'm, I'm just going to show it. So this is a random paper uh, that was discussed before. It's a random paper on state of the art, I'm going to get there, uh, depth estimation from monocular image. So here you take a single image and then you try to estimate the depth and actually modern techniques will try to estimate um, metric depth. So like distances in, in meters. Uh, I'm trying to find the results section so yeah, I can show you something that's worth discussing. Yeah, here we go. So this is state of the art techniques. So given an input image, uh, you are able to train, uh, so these are relatively hard images. You can able to train a model that will give you this as an output. And what is particularly interesting is that different from other tasks we've been discussing today, depth can be self-supervised or can be just supervised by collecting multiple data and so on. So, and it has been done, right? So this particular paper might not be of that family, but it's a mixture. Like there's some paper who show they can self-supervise and then there's model that show that given some supervision, we can push envelope. So I'm of the belief that given enough data, we, we can today or no, no, the day after today, we can get very good monocular depth estimation for, from zero supervision, right? Just from having a large volume of cameras moving around in the world. Mm -hmm. And when that becomes true, then this provides super strong information for estimating extents of the objects, right? As we discussed, this is one of the key fundamental issues. It doesn't solve everything because you can still think that the car is still context to the ground. It provides a stronger additional queue that that queue will help close the gap between weakly supervised and fully supervised. Uh, so uh, basically ideas like that of which information can be obtained without any supervision that is helping reduce these fundamental ambiguities or reduce the amount of data you need to uh, resolve these fundamental ambiguities that we discussed before of object extent and concurrences uh, are going to be what pushes forward the specific field of Google supervised learning. So more data, but still a few levels. Mm -hmm. 
Another question from Brent. Just for fun, does anyone have ideas on how active perception could be combined with weekly wise methods for learning and fine tuning in specific physical environments? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. Um, so I guess what, what you mean by active perception is uh, something like reinforcement learning kind of set where uh, where the agent is kind of looking for the uh for the for the training data itself right i i think uh by adding the yeah, that's what usually what we mean right yeah by by adding the weak uh the the strength of supervision dimension to reinforcement learning uh, it becomes more interesting setup like the agent is kind of determining uh, itself, which amount of supervision it wants, um, perhaps to achieve two goals. First, to achieve better accuracy, and second, to achieve less uh, less cost for. Yeah, this is actually looping back to the human in the loop idea, right? Like trying to minimize the the cost of uh, asking humans what the label should be for this instance and determining uh, the cost, the, the minimal cost for, for getting the annotation. Well, trying to minimize the cost for annotation as well. So yeah, I think this is an interesting kind of combination of uh, uh, active perception and weak supervision. Rodrigo, do you have anything to add? Sorry, to this? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess it depends a little bit of the tasks you have in mind and the specific constraints you're putting into the game you're playing, right? The setup where you are. But um, I think a baseline I will definitely consider. And no, you are from. I did robotics when I was younger, and you are also in robotics. You probably will know about this. Like, there's a lot of work on just um, letting the agent explore. So basically, you do like a slant technique where you just uh, make sure the the uh, robot has explored the full environment around it. Uh, and again, this depends on the game. This might be a reasonable assumption, not. But the baseline I will suggest is first you do uh, uh, you make sure the agent has full exploration of the environment, and then you have basically a pool of unannotated data on which you can throw more traditional active learning techniques, where you want to select which samples to actually add to the oracle, the in this case annotator. So that would be a, a, since you're asking specifically, like, you know, how it could be combined or what could be done. Um, I think that would be an idea of a baseline that you want to consider. Just make the agent explore the environment to get a bunch of raw data, and then uh, have active learning techniques to select which samples to present in front of the oracle. That should be a baseline for which to start in. And then in the, if in the game you're playing, you're adding a high cost to exploring the environment, like moving the robot is more expensive than dating images, then this might change a bit exactly how you set up. But I will start from there, and then we'll see if, if that's still not good enough. And then there we have some ideas on this. Mm -hmm. uh, not much actually, so I don't have much experience with active learning or uh, sorry, the uh, active perception. There was a follow-up question from Brent. D did you read that, Rodrigo? Did you see that? Uh, no. What is the problem? He was saying, uh, or even just a robot walking in a working in a home environment, having the ability to take actions and explore and interact with objects. Hmm. Yeah, it, it goes back to assumption, right? So the, um, maybe one, one parenthesis, and, and this is good for, for general audience, is um, I'm, again, coming from robotics earlier on in my career, it's, it's like one thing that I was obsessed and I was like, it was my, let's say, like my, my stick that was, I was pushing for it's like, hey, everyone listen to this, is um, perception is not a generic concept, like perception only exists for a given task. Right. You, if you walk on the streets, you can be trying to navigate the streets. You can be counting how many men and women on the street makes it easy. You're trying to guess who has COVID these days. Or you're looking at you know, how many windows are there on the street. Like this, this are basically infinite amount of type of tasks you can define on top of an image. So you don't have a generic perception. Perceptions are always tied in to a specific task you want to execute. So in this example that Brent is proposing, it depends what exactly you want to do. Is the task of the robot to sort things? Is the task of the robot to just do a counting of things? Is the task of the robot to clean up things? Then it will change a lot how you set up the problem of that acquisition um, and that annotation. So I couldn't, I couldn't answer this in generic term without having a more specific definition of the task. And it's important to keep in mind 
that uh, you don't want to throw a system that can learn generic stuff that doesn't exist. You need to you know, sit with your clients and understand well what is the actual task you want to your end system to do, and then and then and then develop for that. And then again, everything will go like the algorithms, the train data, the whole you know, type of data you collect uh, to start from will depend on the on the final application. Okay, so we have a question about a go to paper for weekly supervised learning. Um, I think weekly supervised learning is quite uh, broad, so I'm, I'm not sure whether we have good review papers, but there are some uh, journal papers, I think, more extensive on separate tasks like uh, weekly supervised object detection, segmentation. Um, so I can try to share them, but so far we, I'm not sure whether we have a very extensive review paper in this topic. Maybe we should. Well, I think the best source is to watch the videos from the tutorial. That's clearly the best source. That's why, we, honestly, that's why we do it, right? If there was one paper that we felt like, or like a group of papers that we felt like will cover the way we present these topics well enough, then we just point people to that. Um, I think part of the reasons we want to do the tutorial, other than the, having this no, somewhat limited interaction, but no, face-to-face uh, -face interaction usually. Um, it's, it's just because we, 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 given the feedback we got on the first round of tutorial on this topic, it gives the impression that it's a topic that people are interested on, and there's not a lot of kind of good pedagogical material. And we hope that these videos, now updated two years later, are that source. So it's only three hours, uh, and then you will know, know a big chunk of what needs to be done to get started on this field of weekly supervised learning. So I invite you to check out the videos or the slides. And there was actually another question on the chat from um, Abi Manu uh, regarding for semantic segmentation, which of the weak supervision labeling seems most promising? Image level labeling, box level labeling, or using GANs with some kind of these transfers, I guess, that we discussed before. So this, I, I, I think there's no notion of promising. It's um, each type of annotation has a different cost and will have a different uh, amount of information respect to the tasks you want to have at the end. So clearly box level annotations are richer than image level annotation. So if you have box level annotation, you will get better models. However, box level annotations are more expensive to annotate. And in most box annotation pipelines, you anyway start first by doing image level labeling, image level labeling, and then you start doing uh, box level labeling of the classes that you know are present on the image. It usually goes together. And in the first slot, we, we share the secret of our field, which I'm not sure if we should repeat one more time. Uh, so the little dirty secrets of data set creation uh, is that um, image level labeling can very commonly and very easily become the dominant annotation time uh, above bonding box annotations, or even sometimes above semantic labeling annotations. Um, so psh, it's a secret, don't tell it. Um, so, so it might be, and I think this is kind of one of the points of weekly supervised learning, is that it might be that in practice, it's a better idea to first do all your image level labeling, which is going to be very expensive, and then train a model. And then from that trained model, then you do active learning to annotate whatever is missing. And that might be in form of boxes, or might be in form of clicks, might be in form of scribbles, or might be in other type of forms that will correct the errors of your model. So it depends a bit of what you want to get at. And, and also we'll echo what Jun mentioned also in the first slide is like, in practice, anyways, you will have to have an evaluation and the standard way to do evaluation nowadays is with full dense supervision. And as we mentioned in the first slot, in practice, if you think about practical matters, the, one of the important costs of the annotation process is setting up the pipelines. Like the engineering and the effort and the human infrastructure involved in setting up the pipeline is usually quite high. So if you made the effort of creating the pipeline on which you can annotate data in a fully supervised fashion so you can evaluate, then you have everything ready to also annotate data to train, uh, to generate training data. And as June paper shows, even a little bit of train data can be better than a lot of weekly supervised data not well used, right? So you have to keep that in mind in practice of, of you know, where is the right balance. Um, I think weekly supervised learning makes sense when you really have some, either you already had it from some other reason, previous processes, or you have some organic way of generating this weak supervision and then you want to exploit it. Uh, typical example of these are like all these uh, web interfaces of web products where someone can tell you, oh no, this is wrong. It's not telling you what is wrong, but it's telling you something is wrong. That's an example where you know, Google will get millions of those <laughs> of all kinds of types. Uh, and that is a form of organic self, uh, weak supervision that then since we have the data, we might as better use it. But when you collect the data, uh, 
that you want to think about it. So check a June presentation on evaluation, which talks about this. Check human in the loop presentation on human in the loop annotations. And uh, do keep in mind the discussion we had on the previous slot and this slot about uh, the engineering efforts of setting up pipelines for added annotation. Maybe June, you want to add something on this? Yeah. Uh, and also when you do Wix revision, I don't know if I can really generalize this statement, but um, the typical hyperparameters you introduce when you do Wix revision, uh, they are very sensitive. Like choosing the wrong parameter could really ruin the, the final performance. So it's super important to find the working thresholds for every hyperparameter. And what I actually mean, like what it takes to find a good hyperparameter, especially when there are many of them, is to run this training uh, session multiple times and then checking the validation results multiple times. And this is what we mean by uh, engineering costs. Like you have to spend a lot of uh, uh, time, people and uh, GPUs and electricity to find the right set of hyperparameters. And this is very costly. And I can imagine this could uh, really dominate the, the cost for annotating like really few number of uh, samples per class. Uh, for example, in the, uh, in the paper, in our paper on evaluating weekly supplies object localization paper, um, the, the crossing point between this annotation approach and the uh, engineering approach where you find the right set of hyperparameters happens at about I don't know, one to five samples per class, depending on the data set. So uh, this is really few, right? Um, well, depends on your perspective, but it's, uh, I would say this is a surprising range, at least for me, that you can already beat the, this highly crafted, but using only weeks revision um, approaches with only that few number of uh, fully supervised samples. And this kind of uh, reflects how um, how the how our perception of Wix provision could be distorted. I think maybe to add a, a positive <laughs> mosquito fights, um, yeah. maybe to add a positive a positive sure. twist on this on this last last two points that we have made is um, when when do you want to do weekly supervised data? So I I definitely echo with June that if you're going to do uh, less let's say a less than a thousand of whatever, like less than a thousand of whatever, uh, of a brand new pipeline, then just do fully supervised until proof of the contrary, I, 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 will, I will claim. Um, so you are going to do weekly supervised, or you're going to want to think about weekly supervised when you already have weekly, weekly supervised data right away, either because of previous process or because it's organic, and then you want to bootstrap your next annotation stage. So then you want to first check, well, maybe I already have all the data I need to get the quality I need, or I'm going to use this initial weekly supervised model to guide the notation in a human loop process. That's one scenario. Or the other scenario is like when you know from the beginning, you're going to be huge. You're going to do millions, not thousands, but millions of again, whatever, like millions of classes, millions of images, millions of instances. You, you take your million, but like when you know this, you have multiple order of magnitudes above a thousand, then you might think, okay, maybe this is big enough that it's worth spending two, three, four, five months of engineering time until I can do annotation pipelines that are going to be no, let's be optimistic, two times more efficient, right? So then you need to think that the two times more efficient of human annotator time needs to really run a long time until it pays off the engineering time you put before. But that does exist and that's why people do research and then uh, people like me who are in, in industry do develop these techniques is because yes, in, in practice, those scenarios that I've described exist, but it's not the common, oh, I have a small computer vision problem in my little corner, what do I do now? Um, like most uh, specific industrial application will call for just go fully supervised until proof of the contrary. Basically until proof that you need to scale up to millions instead of thousands. Uh, Hagen, maybe you want to add something on this? Uh, maybe uh, another thing is, uh, so, um, so, okay, so in academia, one of the uh, thing drives us is the, you know, like, uh, how much performance we can get from weak tables. So this is a bit also intellectual kind of uh, question. Uh, but in industry also, um, the question can be how much accuracy do I want? 
And um, so then I guess there will be different flavors. Some uh, people will want very accurate uh, object detection, semantic segmentation, and then some may not require so much. So then the question of uh, weekly supervised learning, how useful it is, will fit into like one of the maybe uh, less precise uh, requirements. I have an example of this where there was a team in Google who wanted to do segmentation of instances so that they could cut them out no, so that it could improve the visualization of ads. So you have like a picture with an ad and then it's like a bottle and you want to automatically make the bottle more salient or bigger or something like that. So they need to have better than a box, but looser than pixel perfect annotations. And we really had a bunch of bonding boxes available. And that's a typical example where basically anything that is like visual, the human brain is not that good at picking little details. So they could get away with right away weekly supervising from boxes without ever having to no, even even design the pipeline so that it pixel level annotations. So there are quite a few applications where actually lose is good enough and weekly supervised will get you there right away. Uh, if you already had in this example, the bonding box data. All right, we're in the last two minutes. So uh, last question rounds. Aha, we have a courageous one. <laughs> will the recordings to be available online? If if uh, Zoom doesn't fail us, yes, it, it did fail us in the previous workshop I was, so no promises, but it worked for the first lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe a more uh, specific question to end on? <laughs> maybe we can end with, uh, since it's the very last uh, part, maybe we had one of the prepared questions we had was about like, where do we see the field of weekly supervised training and evaluation in one, five and 10 years? Maybe that could be like an ending topic. What do you guys think? Hello? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, about this, uh, I always like to uh, go back to this um, uh, pre-trained model idea where you have, uh, you wish to build a system like a, a huge pre-trained model, uh, which could right away solve a lot of vision tasks um, without further, without like lots of full provision for the target task. So this is, uh, I believe, already to some extent starting to happen in the in the natural language domain, where they have a lot of data and like they, they use this uh, huge amount of web crawl data to to build this uh, beast called uh, GPT-3. And then they, they checked uh, the zero shot or future learning performances on typical natural language tasks. And it turns out to work uh, a lot better with this uh, immense factor of mag magnitude larger data. And this kind of uh, quantum jump in the zero shot transferability or future transferability is yet to happen in vision domain. So if this is uh, going to happen, then, uh, then probably we can just rely on this uh, pre-trained model and maybe a few uh, fully supervised samples for the target task to, to solve many problems in vision domain. And um, this could perhaps happen in multiple steps. So maybe the maybe the intermediate step is to build a, a several a set of uh, multiple models specializing in different vision domains. And then, uh, as an engineer or as a practitioner, you have to find the right pre-trained model for for transferring to your target task, and then fine tuning with your few samples your target. Uh, task samples to to adapt this pre-trained model and then you move on to this uh, one large model that solves many stuff but yeah i'm saying this because you said this is a 10-year goal um mm -hmm. I, I can't uh, i can't comment on how realistic this uh, this could be but yeah just saying well it's just to be 2030 <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hagen, what do you think? One year, five years, 10 years? So what was the question? So is it the future or evaluation? Or where, where do you see the field of weekly supervised training and evaluation in five, 
in one, five, and ten years in the future? I see. Well, uh, I mean, uh, in one year, I don't expect like a big leap, but whenever I say that there is a big leap, so um, last time when I said that in my uh, uh, PhD defense, uh, so I thought it would improve 5%, that was uh, uh, AlexNet came up and um, results improved 10%. So, um, so but uh, I suppose in, in uh, so I I also see that um, they will need to use to reach to the uh, level of uh, supervised, fully supervised methods. We will need to use at the end um, uh, more priors and and I really think that uh, videos will be quite important. And also, I think that generator met methods when they start working much better. Um, we will have more chance that uh, with the supervised methods do better because all the methods are so far discriminated. So I can see that uh, generator models may not suffer from many limitations we have in the discriminator uh, models. Um, so in terms of results, it's difficult to say something, but uh, so yeah, these are my uh, estimations. What will be useful? In the, what will be used in the with the supervisor? Okay, I like it. It's quite complimentary. I guess my, my vision for one year is similar to yours, like just a few tweaks and a few more points and a few more tricks, but not, not big changes. I think in a five year time scale, this idea of hybrid training where no data set is fully annotated with everything you want, but it's just like a mix and match of different type of weak supervision with some captions, some scribbles, some boxes, and no, nothing is consistent and everything is a bit messy. I think at scale, that will be the normal thing. And in industry, it tends to be like that because you conglomerate a different, a lot of different sources. So I think we'll push more and we'll see more papers that exploit that. Uh, and I think open image in some sense is, is get, getting there. If you look at the data available now and uh, no, what's coming in the future, uh, it's, 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 going, it's going to push, I think, the field in that area. And then in 10 years, I maybe similar to June, there will be this you know, super strong visual GPT-X but, but I don't think we're going to do full supervision. I think with GPTX, we're going to have a annotation dialogue with them. So you will have a, literally like a small chat. And they say like, hey, I want to detect cats on top of uh, hats on top of cats. And I say, oh, you mean this kind of cats? Yes, yes. And then this kind of hats? Oh, yeah, no, this part of the hat I mean. And then you're done with the task. So annotation dialogues rather than full supervision. That's how I see my ideal 10 years uh, time scale. And that's the time we had today. Thanks a lot for all the attendees and thanks a lot for all the attendees who ask questions. I hope this was maximally useful for you. And um, I wish you the best of progress in the field of Google supervised learning and computer vision in general and looking forward to read your papers in the future. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.